like a rock star with this mic thing on me. <laughs> it was kind of odd. So it's great to be here. First, I love Lithuania. I'm here with Greg Gardner, who works with me as well. You'll see him around with me. And you guys have just been so welcoming and love the food especially, and it's been great. So thanks so much for having us here. Um, you've heard from a lot of really great, smart people today, and I hope we can contribute a little bit to the body of knowledge just through our own experience. And two disclaimers before I start. One, what we're gonna share today and then a lot more in detail tomorrow. Um, it's just where we are today. And what I've learned is over time, that we grow and we learn and we change. And so this is a point of time, and I'm sure in a year or two, we'll even be better. So for disclaimer number one, we do not pretend to have all the answers. Disclaimer number two, we are big into R&D, which means rob and duplicate. <laughs> a lot of our ideas we've taken from great people like Dr. Bernard, somebody we've worked with named Kevin Fox, um, just really smart people, and wherever we can rob and duplicate, we want to do it. And that's the beauty of being in a community of people who have a similar vision, because we can share ideas and support each other in this journey of con continual process improvement. So I'm going to go through um, what we're doing in Utah. I'm going to start first with some of our own beliefs that we have and then talk a little bit about measures, a lot more of that tomorrow, and then some of the tools we use, just a few of them so you can get a sense. Now, this cane means I am blind. So two things, one, my goal is not to fall off the podium today. It's goal number one. And goal number two, if I am speaking to a slide that doesn't exist, you guys can tell me that, okay? I told Alan already, Dr. Bernard, to make sure he tells me that. Um, so the first slide, and the other deal is, Alan, promise me, if I can get through all of these slides and not make a mistake, what do I get? I get a hot chocolate. So you guys need to help me out here, okay? Um, number one is introductory slide, one for one. I'm good on that. Number two, a little bit about Utah. Our population is a little over three million. So about the same size as Lithuania, as I understand. Um, we've got lots of mountains, a beautiful national parks, the home of Mormonism. If you've ever heard of Mormons, that's the capital, uh, headquarters of the Mormon church. Just lots of great stuff, love the government. Um, and it's a pretty conservative environment and really dedicated to um, fiscally prudent measures. And so my role is pretty unique because I'm over operations for the state as well as budget. And I'll talk about that at the end of how neat it is to be in the opportunity where you can look at both operations and budget at the same place because quite frankly, I don't know how you budget without knowing operations. So it's a really great opportunity for that to happen. Just to give you a sense of um, our set setup in Utah, we have 24 cabinet members. And I guess that would be like ministers in Lithuania, from what I've understood. So we have 24 cabinet members or cabinet agencies, ranging from everything from environmental quality to agriculture, to transportation, to human services, to working with children in foster care, to the correctional system and the prison system. So a wide range of um, departments that we work with, and um, every single one of them is now engaged in this initiative. So no excuses that it doesn't work for you or for anyone else, because we've seen application in every environment. And we'll give you a couple examples in kind of traditional process environments, and then some that are more around human services and working with people. Um, first, before we get into some of the tools, um, I want to share a little bit about uh, our belief system. This journey of process improvement is about changing people's hearts and minds. The mind is almost the easier part, right? Training, tools, insights, concepts, we can teach those. But to get people's hearts into it is the more interesting and challenging part of this process. And being really clear in this is um, important for organizations, but especially for us as individuals. And we have to challenge our own assumptions and the limitations and constraints we put on ourselves, what we really believe about this work before we can really make the kind of impacts we wanna make in our organizations. So a few things that are really important for us. I'm gonna give some personal stories and examples for about 10 minutes, and then we'll get into the tools of what we're using. Um, you've heard a lot about focus, a lot today. 
and it is the critical distinguishing factor in my mind between TOC and so many other um, process improvement tools we're probably all familiar with. But we know it theoretically, and I thought I, I kind of understood this, but I really got it in my heart when I was in Maryland. I worked in Washington, D.C. for a while, although I hate to claim that sometimes, but I did. And I had lost a lot of vision and had to go to a very intense training program for blind people so that I could learn to travel independently. And we were learning to cross very complicated intersections, um, you know, lots of traffic in busy, busy cities. And as you can imagine, standing on a corner with lots of traffic, lots of noise, lots of cars, lots of people talking, there's a lot of noise going on. Lots of noise, lots of distraction. What we had to learn to do is to focus in on the traffic patterns by listening that would allow us to comfortably and safely cross the streets, which meant tuning out a lot of the background noise that wasn't helpful. This concept of focus became not just a theoretical concept to use in process improvement, but it's a life skill that I use every day. Learning and believing that focus and prioritizing is critical has got to be something you believe in. And it's really hard because sometimes it means saying no. Saying yes is easy. We all want to say yes to everyone, to be popular and please and look competent and responsive. Learning to say no is a really important part of this journey. And it's something we all need to pay attention to. So our first belief, we've got to focus. Second have high expectations, high expectations. I want to t tell you about a little boy named Tony. Um, he was a little blind kid and a dear friend of mine, Dr. Frederick Schroeder, a brilliant man, worked with blind children. And he, Dr. Schroeder would say that he probably, more than anyone on this planet, had high expectations for blind people and what they could achieve. He was very successful and just had very high expectations for people. And he worked with this little boy, Tony, and Tony came to him and he said, um, at the time, his name was Mr. Schroeder. I want to play tag. I guess you guys have tag in Lithuania, right? Yes? Don't nod your heads. I will not see you. Yes? Okay. You have tag. Um, this little boy who was blind wanted to play tag. And Mr. Schroeder, Dr. Schroeder, went home, and he thought about this. And he's like, how can a little blind boy play tag? Is that even possible? What do you think most adults would say? No. I mean, how is a blind kid going to play tag, right? It's not possible. He went back the next day, and before he could share his, his decision that on this one occasion, Tony was going to have to sit out. Tony was not going to be able to engage. Tony came up to Dr. Schroeder, and he said, I've got the best news. I've figured it out. Because, right, aren't kids like that? They don't have this thing if it can't be done. And he had figured out if he had taken little jars glass jars and put pebbles in them and gave those to his friends and they'd shake them while they were running and they ha kind of had a safe place where he could run that he could find his friends and play tag like everyone else. Really easy, low-tech solution. What Tony did, which I think is so important, is he asked how it can be done, not if. When we go into designing problems and solutions, the wonderful thing I love about constraints management, TOC, is that it starts with the belief and the assumption that anything is possible. With the right thinking, with the right amount of work, with the right kind of logic, we can break difficult conflicts, we can find solutions, we can look at root causes, we can have huge improvements in our systems. But we ourselves, not intellectually, but in our hearts, have to always believe that it's how something could be done and not if. Too many times in government, I'll hear people say, yeah, I would do it if I had more money, if my staff weren't so difficult, if I had more supportive leadership, then I would do it. When we start going that direction, if, if things were different, then I would make a change, we need to check ourselves because we're probably becoming too skeptical and we're probably putting a lot of self-imposed limits on what's really possible. So the challenge that we have internally and that we really try to embrace in our agency, it's never if it can be done, but it's always how. We just have to figure it out. The next belief that we have is that every system can have improvement. As I talked earlier, we have 24 cabinet agencies that are engaged in this process, all very different. 
Dr. Holt, if any of you know him, made a great statement once, and he said, we are all very special, but none of us are unique. And I love that. All of us have very great environments, and we can all think we're different. If you're in social services, you may think, I don't do applications. That's not relevant to me. Actually, everything is a system, and every system can be pr improved and significantly. So we start with that belief as well. And that's something that over time you start to see and experience and you really start to internalize that everything's possible in any system. So um, the final two things is we have to demonstrate measurable improvement. I'll talk a little bit about measures today and you heard in the earlier sessions talking about measures. Uh, measures can sometimes be a a fuzzy world and we can get hung up around them. I'm going to talk about some, a very easy way to do measures in our world. But when we're taking money from other people, the taxpayer, our, our friends, our neighbors, and they're giving their money to government, they expect and deserve for every dollar we invest, they should get more and more value. Measurable value. There will always be more demand for our needs then there will be a available revenue or resources. There just always will be. Demand will always exceed what we have available. So every dollar we have, we have to stretch and maximize and know that everything we do makes a difference. Sometimes in government, we can get so busy in activity, in strategic planning, in initiatives, and in junk and blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the day, we don't know if we made a difference or not. And we hear about it, and you, again, you heard about it earlier, but it is critical because we're not just talking about, you know, sometimes in our day-to-day -day work, we lose sight of what we're doing. But what we do has such, in the public world, and I love what Ken talked about earlier, that public service is noble. What people do in government has such an impact on the economy, on people's lives, on families, on holding, pulling people out of poverty, on quality of life, on clean air. It is a substantial impact on people's lives. And they deserve and we deserve to know that we can actually tell them what we did, this change, we can tell you with evidence that it's, you're better off. So that's critical. And the final thing is perseverance. Um, some of this work takes time and energy, and Winston Churchill once had a great quote. He said, success is moving from one failure to the next without losing enthusiasm, <laughs> and I love that. Sometimes we don't do things perfectly, and we learn from our mistakes. Sometimes you start a big initiative, and the day-to-day -day just pushing through and making it happen can be tedious and take time and thought and effort. And I have found in my life I've been exposed to some great leaders, some great mentors, and one of the unique characteristics they have is this concept of perseverance, is pushing through to the end and getting the result that you want despite challenges or obstacles that may come up because everything can be overcome in our mind, in our frame set. So those beliefs work for us. Those are in addition to the great beliefs and structures that TOC has to offer about simplicity and the fo focusing steps and people aren't bad, but maybe their assumptions are. We can always find win-win solutions. There's just so many great things. And I, I share that because, again, this is a journey not just of the mind, but of the heart. And if we don't have our heart and our passion and our concern and our empathy in the right place, it's very hard for our mind to follow. So we always need to be challenging that ourselves. And that's why I love coming to these conferences because I get motivated and inspired by so many of you doing the great work out there. Um, okay, so don't tell me what slide I'm on because I want my hot chocolate. I am going to the next one, success. So we developed a framework, it's called the success framework and it stands for something. I won't go through all of it today, but I'll tell you kind of what it's about. And we've learned through trial and error that there needs to be some sequence and some sequencing to our improvement efforts. And that's a real important part of TOC is prioritization. So we start the first for S starts with setting goals and targets and measures. When we first start an initiative, what are we trying to accomplish? Why do we exist? How do we measure success today? How do we baseline where we are so we can measure against it in the future? And having really clear direction on where we're wanting to go. It sounds easy, but I've just seen too many initiatives where people start with these big strategic planning processes and paperwork everywhere, and they don't know where they're going. So we really talk a lot about this, and again, this will be in our measurement section. The next part, U, is for use thinking tools. 
what are the thinking tools we have in TOC? Well, there's so many of those, but we want to think logically about our processes and our systems before we just start jumping into improving them. So as we've heard so much today, we want to improve in the right areas, the areas where we can get the biggest return on investment for our limited time and attention. After we've thought about our processes and used logic to think about it and see them the right way, then we create strategy. That's actually the solutions we're going to have to fix the problems. After we have a strategy, then maybe we will look at organization design if you need to. And is Ken here? Ken, I love what Ken said earlier today about the Legos. Um, I've seen it too often. The first thing somebody does is they reorganize the charts on you know, the organization, and it's a mess. Organization should always align with strategy. Too often, what happens is people put an organization in place and then expect the strategy and the process to align to the organization. And it's totally backwards. It should never happen that way. So only after you have your process, your system design in place, then you can take a look at organization design if it needs to be realigned to support the strategy and process flow. After that, we look at the E, which is engaged staff. Um, in government, I know in the United States, I would assume here, we have to have lots of performance plans and things like that. So how do you line that all up in a way that people's day-to-day -day work aligns with the throughput of the organization? How do you get them involved in solving problems, being excited about the work, respecting the contributions they have to make from their unique perspectives? So engaging staff is huge. The next S is success is synchronizing our IT projects and our policies. Again, so often we just launch on automating things and launch on starting new policies without understanding what the entire system should be doing. So we don't want to automate unless we've designed our system in the appropriate way. We don't want to set new policies until we understand how the policies are going to affect the throughput of the organization. Um, I work with the legislature a lot in Utah. Um, and. We experience, you know, it goes to Ken's piece a little bit this morning of why systems become so dysfunctional. And very often it's because policies are just created with no context of the impact it will have on the system or throughput. And finally, the last S of success is staying focused. We know that the most valuable and scarce resource is often the management time and attention. We as leaders in this room, if we aren't focused, I can guarantee you your organization isn't focused. The most valuable thing we have is our time and attention and that of our staff. And making sure if something's a priority for you, you spend the right attention to it daily, weekly, or it won't happen. And it won't just happen automatically somehow in your organization. If you're not willing to sacrifice the time and the attention it takes to launch and follow through with initiative, don't expect it from your staff. If you want to know what somebody's priorities are, look at how they spend their time and energy. It's a good question that I have to ask myself often. The time I'm spending at work, is it reflective of the priorities I have for the organization? So when you line all of those things up, we talk about this looking at the entire organization. You can't just improve one part of the organization without understanding there are impacts on other elements. And we want to look at the entire system as a whole. So that's success, S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S -S. And um, that's the framework we work off. So let me, oh, I've lost my place. Is that it? Did that move? OK. Um, so just quick results. And we're going to show a few case studies. But one, we started this whole process. I was executive director of the Department of Workforce Services. We ran over 100 different programs. And um, you know, it was one of the largest agencies in Utah. Um, and at the time, we had the, what we called the perfect storm. It was uh, right during the recession, and our caseloads went super high, and of course we could expect that revenue would go down, so we would not have as much money. And we love that. We love constraints, right, Greg? <laughs> because we see them as opportunities to get better. So this challenge gave us a great opportunity. So we, had to, we were doing um, food stamps, welfare programs, unemployment insurance, a lot of stuff for low-income individuals, and we had to determine if they were eligible or not. So some of the results, we reduced our operating expenses by about 33 3%. We significantly improved our quality. At the time, we are 48th in the nation. We became number 10, top 10, sometimes wavering between 5 and 8. Um, we look at audits and question costs. We had zero question costs for two years in a row, which is remarkable. And we were able to totally 
t um, cap out on all the federal timeliness standards. Expedited food stamps, seven days, we got it to two. And even when we look at the timeliness issues, we still think there's lots of room for improvement there. So we, at the end of the day, um, I'll show you the picture. Is this the cool chart? Did it flip? It did not. Did it flip? Did it flip? Am I pushing the wrong thing? I know it's right. Is that it? Now what did I do? I don't know. I hate PowerPoints. You cited people are so high maintenance. I'll tell you what. <laughs> All right. We fi fix that. So we get to the cool chart. Okay. So the cool chart, this just gives you an example. Our caseloads went up significantly. They almost doubled. We had, to, well, at the end of the day, we just mapped it out the other day. It's probably a 60% increase in caseloads. And our costs went down significantly, mostly in FTEs, no layoffs, zero layoffs, all through planned attrition. As people are retired, we just held those positions back. We did all this while improving quality and um, improving timeliness. So those were important results. And we started to understand that there are really great opportunities in TOC to apply in other areas. So we started to apply it to the workforce division, people who were low income that normally needed jobs and it would take them months and months to get a job. We would do a very compact getaway of all the wait time and batching and stuff that happens with jobs. And we are getting 60 people jobs within two to four weeks. So we saw lots of successes in lots of areas. And so the governor asked us to take this to all the other agencies across the state. What a, are you going to, will you just do that? Okay. Greg's going to do it with me. He's my side, side guy. So, um, Great results, and we were really excited about it. So Utah's goal is to deliver continuing improving services at lower and lower costs. Specifically, next, the target. Governor Herbert um, has made a target that we should improve government performance by at least, the operative term, because we don't want limits, at least 25% during the remainder of his term. And we look at that through a combination of quality throughput and cost. And I'll talk about that in a second, because those are our basic performance measures. Some agencies would say 25% seems like a lot. Does that seem like a lot to you guys? It does? To some, it seems like a lot. To others, they'd be like, what? You could do 50%. What's your problem? So we've had a big range of um, response to that number. And I'll t we go back to this thing of ambitious targets and high expectations. What we have found, if we keep the measures too, too low or if we just say improve, people will improve in their area of their comfort zone. We will start to solve problems because we know the answer to that. So we say, yeah, I can improve by 2% because I know how to get there. We want to set the target above our comfort zone and above where we know the answer is because it will force us to think creatively. If I have two sets of managers, and this manager said of the room, I say, I want you to improve by 100%, and these guys, I say, I want you to improve by 2%, do you think there will be different conversations? Hugely different conversations in the room. So the 25% is something to get unity of vision and urgency and focus, but we're saying 25% minimum. We've already seen some that have exceeded that in a very short period of time. Um, so it's a 25% improvement target. So let's talk a little bit about measures and how we're doing this. Um, we use something called quality throughput divided by operating expense. And tomorrow we'll be showing about a nine minute video that will walk you through the details of this a little bit more. But this is our basic performance measure. And then we have another set that we'll be developing and working with Dr. Bernard on as well with operational measures. But these performance measures should be very simple and we believe less is more. Too many measures becomes confusing for people. They can sometimes even conflict with each other. People can't attend to all of the measures. They become very confusing. So there's three critical performance measures we think are important and relevant um, in almost every environment. One is um, your throughput or your capacity, right? How many people can you serve in a period of time? How many units can you produce in a period of time? How much, you know, can you meet the demand, right? Ken talked a lot today about flow, you know, improving your flow time and how that impacts your flow rate or your throughput. So how critical that is. So we want to know that. Can you meet the demand that's coming in? But the other critical part of that is you could be meeting demand but doing it pretty lousily, if that's even a word, and a pretty lousy job. You could be doing a pretty lousy job. So you could be serving 100 people, but only five people that you've served are getting the benefit of that service. So essentially, you've wasted 95% of the resources. 
What we want to see is quality throughput. So for everyone you serve or for everything, anything you produce, we want to know it meets basic quality standards. We define quality in three big ways. One, reliability. Can you be reliable? In government, are we reliable? Not so much. <laughs> we talk about averages a lot. We want reliability standards just as much as private sector has. We talk about accuracy. That has a lot to do with benefits and things like that. Were we accurate in making the decision? Did the right person get the right benefit in the right amount? And then we look at program effectiveness. This is so relevant when we're in social service environments, when we're talking about recidivism rates and corrections, or dealing with kids in foster care. Did our interventions make a measurable improvement in their lives? These are hard conversations to have sometimes. They are not always easy to define. But the most important thing I think we do in our work is to have these conversations for a couple of reasons. One, it creates absolute focus and clarity on what they should be spending their time on. When you really have to define quality throughput, you get clear pretty quickly what you should be doing, what your staff should be doing, and what kind of interventions you need to bring to the table to make a difference. 20 minutes? Oh, laughter, I still, I just went through 20 minutes. Oh my gosh, I gotta speak quickly. I'm trying to slow down for the translators. So you're gonna have to listen quickly now, because I'm gonna go fast. Um, then we talk about operating expense. It's great if you have great quality and if you're getting faster, but if your costs are skyrocketing, you're not solving the problem either. So we wanna look at all three of these elements in relationship to one another and make sure they're in harmony and improving at the same time. So we wanna see more and more throughput or capacity, more and more quality at the same or reduced costs. And as we've talked about earlier, if you can improve your quality and your throughput some, through some of the tools from TOC, your operating expenses generally just take care of themselves and can be reduced. Um, we have a different mindset in government. We don't want to expand our profitability. We want to maintain costs and be good stewards of the taxpayer dollar. We'll talk about these a lot more tomorrow, but this gives you a general framework and essentially um, it creates a ratio or a cost per case. And if your cost per case goes up, you know that something's wrong with your system and that you're failing in one of those areas. You don't want to sacrifice any of those areas. That's the deal. You don't get to improve quality and throughput and have your costs go up out the roof. All three have to be aligned with each other or you're not doing a good job in your system. So quality throughput over operating expense. Um, just, uh, I'm, I'm gonna skip the Smith thing. Just skip that, we have a measurable thing. Real quick, we, there's lots of tools you can use in constraints management, critical chain for project management environments was really important. Distribution retail environments, which we kind of have one agency that's involved in that, so there's solutions for that. And, for many of our agencies, we use something called a throughput operating strategy. So I'll walk you through some of this pretty quickly. Throughput operating strategy is simply a one-page strategy of what your system should look like. We talk about system improvement a lot, right? But as Aristotle said, it all begins with defining the terms. <laughs> if we can't define what our system is, where it begins and where it ends, I think it's pretty hard to improve it it's pretty hard to know what process to focus on. And a, sim a system is simply a series of processes and programs that come together for a common good or a goal. And that's why defining your goal is so critical. So the TOS gives you a high level map of what your system looks like. It defines the beginning and the end. It defines the goal. And it's really a game plan of what go good looks like for your organization. If you did this, Thing every day you would do a pretty good job and you can get better and better at it. It's also very simple so you can communicate it to multiple people, multiple stakeholders, frontline people. It's a really easy way for people to get engaged. Again, this is not our work. We've modified some of this, especially the parts after this, but we've worked with a guy named Kevin Fox. So again, rob and duplicate as much as you can. It's a great strategy. Um, so this is the first place. We're going to walk through a throughput operating strategy that you would um, be in a doctor's office because we can all relate to a doctor's office, so it's a pretty straight thing. The first step in do, doing a TOS, and we'll show you guys tomorrow how to build one in more detail, um, is you just map the major process steps. Because again, if you're going to start improving processes or accelerating, you need to know how they relate to each other and which ones you need to choose first and why. So we start with the process steps, the doctor's office, patient check-in, they pull the files, patient prep, treatment and diagnose, testing plans, treatment plans, and then they check out. 
So major processes are mapped out. Now, this alone doesn't tell you much, but we'll show you in a little bit um, what that means over time. Um, but before we get that, we want to take basics of constraints. You've heard a lot about it today, but constraints are simply the part of your system that regulates your overall throughput. In some cases, to your wink is link, is sometimes how people think about it. But in other cases, we see it a little differently. And I'll talk about the other ways we define it. But it is essentially what regulates the throughput of your system. And it's where you want to start focusing your energy and your time, ABC graph. You guys have seen maybe versions of this. You've got a system. Pretend this represents different people, A, B, C, D, E. Each person has different capacity to produce or to serve. C is 10. So C is the constraint of the organization, right? It has the, the least capacity to produce or to serve. So you could actually go in and try to improve A and B, or you could try to improve C and D, but the overall throughput of your system is limited to what C can produce, which is 10. And what we see a lot in systems without having the global sense of what your system is, people will start going improving in A or B or D or E, and they'll have a great promotion. They say, hey, boss, you give me a 1,000 bucks. I can improve A's capacity by 400%. Well, who cares? The system's not better off. Not only is it not better off, it's almost worse because people who are downstream are getting stressed out because they don't have the capacity. It creates backlogs, inventory, lots of other problems in your system. So figuring out how to find your constraint is really important. In a production environment, it's pretty easy. You can just see where the bottlenecks build up, right? If you're going to double the amount of work coming into your system, you can just anticipate where the bottleneck is, and that becomes a pretty easy constraint. You can go to the next two slides. But what do you do if you're in an environment where it's highly around um, skilled resources? Social services environments, correctional officers, case managers working with kids, working with people with disabilities. Where's your constraint? Well, we think it's really important to start defining this a little differently. One, we use the word control point because constraint for some people could be a negative thing. They don't want to be the constraint. So we use the word control point, And we like to strategically select where we place the control point because we don't want it moving around a lot. When constraints move around a lot, the business has to change the rules. And that can become very problematic in systems and organizational changes. So we try to keep steady as much as we can. And we'll selectively choose the control point. You can go to the next slide. But here's how we define control point. It can be your weakest link or your bottlenecks if you're in a you know, pretty fairly structured system. But we also look at it this way. What's your most highest skilled resource? What's the resource that's hardest to get highest in demand, hardest to train, hardest to maintain. There are some resources, people, that you hire, and some are much more expensive. Some are in demand, so it's very hard to find and attract them. Some of them take years and years to get trained to where they're really proficient. So when we think about constraints, or now we call them a control point in that light, in our environments, it gives us a little more clarity about where we want to strategically put the control point to regulate the flow of our systems. So the doctor's example, where should the control point be? And you can put up the example where the, it's red, okay. Um, you can see in this example, while every piece is important, patient check-in, pulling the file, where do you think the control point should be? Based off the definition, highest skilled resource, most expensive to train, treatment and diagnose, right? If I had two investments, one was a million dollar investment and so now there's 100,000, I want both of them to perform, but I want the million dollar investment to really perform, right? In our systems, in every system, especially in social service environments, you're gonna see constraints that take time to get really well trained. And you want them to regulate the flow of the rest of your system. So with treatment and diagnose, if a doctor currently only has the capacity to see 40 patients a day, should the people up front be getting more effective so they can check in 80 people a day? No, right? Doesn't make sense. And that's why it's so important to have a throughput operating strategy or some other version. I don't care. Do whatever you want. But a sense of what your system is so you understand how everything relates because if you start improving one part of your system, you could muck up everything else. So here, treatment and diagnose, where the doctor spends his or her time, is a really critical, important resource. So we can build the TOS, and I'm going to, is this the, what's next? 
Oh, we add a lot more stuff to the TOS. You find the control point, and then we define what does good look like. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. But it gives you a sense of the overall flow of the system, what should happen at each step. And it starts setting up some really important discussions about measures. Sometimes people don't know what to measure or how to do it. Sometimes after building a TOS, the clarity around quality throughput becomes very obvious. So it's a great exercise if just for that purpose alone, to get the clarity people need to know how to perform, do performance measures. Um, this is an example of APMP. Okay, so this is an example of adult probation and parole. In Utah, we have a correctional system where most of our folks are in parole or probation as compared to the prison system based off our sentencing structure. We have about 16,000 people in probation and parole right now. And we've been working extensively with them and they are on fire and in six months, you're gonna see some amazing stuff come out of this group. The goal here is to reduce recidivism. We want less people going into prison once they've had contact with the prison system. So we've worked with them, I won't walk through the details, but they were able to, with a lot of clarity, understand where they should focus. For them, it was their case management function. A parole officer, a probation officer has to interact with a um, inmate or a, a somebody who's on parole or probation. I'll show you later how much time they actually spend doing what they should be doing. But they found that what they need to be doing and what good looks like for them at the control point is to be spending more and more time in supervision with evidence-based practices. They spend very little of their time actually interfacing with the parolee because they're doing all these other distraction works. And when they do intervene with them, they need to have evidence-based practices that they're confident their intervention will make a difference for them. We've set up quality measures around here. Throughput is the number of um, in individuals served. We have two elements of quality. One is the percent of folks that go into the prison system. We want that reduced. And the second one is a risk score that we have found through doing some data analysis. If we reduce their risk score by 25%, only 6% of those folks go back to prison. So those measures alone, we just had a conference with all of the supervisors of this group last week. They have perfect clarity where they need to be spending their time. And they haven't had that. I don't know if they ever had. This alone is gonna give them significant um, uh, leverage in making differences in their organization. Okay, what's next? He threw me off now. I was on my perfect role. What's my next slide? Blue light, real quick. One question you wanna ask yourselves is at the, at the point of your control point of your constraint, how should you be spending your time? And Kevin Fox gave a great example, so I'm gonna use it. And he talks about blue light and he went into a manufacturing plant and he was watching, um, them operate and the guy in charge was talking about how busy they were and they needed to build a second plant because they were just out of capacity and he watched them and this welder they were doing bumpers and this welder would pick up a bumper and come over weld for a little bit move move the bumper over here take the plastic off and go back and start the process all over again and when he looked at the amount of blue light right because i guess welders have blue light there wasn't a lot of blue light time going on the welder was doing a lot of other things other than welding. What we want to see happen at the control point of the constraint is to see a lot of blue light. We want to start doing what we should be doing, our blue light, and we want to stop doing all the other stuff that's distracting us or interfering with our ability to maximize capacity at the constraint. So we talk a lot about blue light and how critical that is. So let's quickly go to the focusing steps. You guys have heard these. For government purposes, TOC uses words like exploit and subordinate, and some people don't like those words <laughs> in government. So we have different words of talking about this, but we identify or select the control point. Then we maximize it, which is another way of saying exploit. We want to get as much out of it as we can. And then instead of saying subordinate the system, we want to align everything else with the control point. We want to make sure everything else in the system is supporting the control point. And then finally, if we need to, we'll elevate it and add new resources. On the budget side, as people come asking for more money, we want to know that they've gone through these steps before they get a dime. So we're kind of hard nosed about that. Money is not always the answer. In very many cases, it's just not the answer at all. You could throw more money to it, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're still just gonna get 
bad results. So we don't like to put money until we know people have gone through the steps. So they go through this. And so the first step is once you've identified your control point, you want to maximize it. We talked about, number one, really understanding what your blue light is, which means you know what you should be know doing. I mean, the people you supervise, do they know day in and day out what they should be focused on? Two, we want them to stop doing what they should not be doing. And Dr. Bernard talks about this a lot, and I love it. It's the hardest part, I think, of TOC sometimes is stopping. Having the discipline to say no and stop doing the stuff we shouldn't be doing. Third thing, that we have everything we need to do our job. In other words, we call that full kit. And finally, we have enough work. We're not waiting. The control point's not starved. Very seldom does that happen in government. But sometimes we do see waiting as a big problem. Um, so we want to really maximize. What's next? I, OK, let's skip the first two IGs. Just go to the IGs for corrections. Um, we use something called the interference diagram, and again, we'll kind of walk you through this more, but we take the control point, we identify what its blue light should be, what it should really be doing, and we stick it in the middle of a circle, and we say, what's everything that's interfering with your ability to do your job? And I tell you, if you want to get your frontline staff engaged, this is a great opportunity because they will unload, and they'll tell you everything that you're doing and everyone else is doing to prevent them from really focusing on their blue light. Yeah, APMP. Yeah, skip to APMP. APMP, adult probation and parole, they've got 65 interferences, minimum. They've got lots of stuff that's interfering with their ability to do their job. Well, that's a lot still. That can seem like, well, what do I do with all that? So we even want to make it simpler because, again, this is about focus. Again, we stole something from Dr. Bernard. We love it, the gap analysis. We take it. We do a bundling process. Um, we do a quick root cause. I'll talk about that in a second. And some, we have different approaches for different agencies and how mathematical and precise we get on the gap analysis. But essentially, you can say in AP&P, 20% of their time is spent on blue light and doing what they should be doing, these case managers, these people working with the inmates. 20% of their time. The rest of their time is spent in interferences, <clears throat> as you can see. This gives them great insight into what's really happening. You know, Ken talked about the invisibility of our systems. They can see now what's happening and start to prioritize where they're going to put their improvement efforts. We ask them also to look at root causes, cause and effects. You guys have heard a lot about that today, so I won't spend too much time on that. Because as they go tackle something, we want to make sure they're really tackling the, the, the biggest cause as possible. So all the interferences in that bundle will go away as much as possible. Um, so that's just, that alone has given folks great insights into what's happening. So next steps, we do a lot of work with agencies in different environments. We do, um, we'll be teaching them about acceleration. I'll show you guys a quick graph here. Throughput accounting, which is just gonna be a fantastic thing. We're looking at aggregate buffering in our budget system, um, doing some modeling with Dr. Bernard on that. We are um, going to be talking about mistake proofing, how you build that into the system so you can avoid all the CYA stuff that Ken's talked about. So lots of different aspects of, of working with our agencies as we move forward, again, with very high expectations, no excuses, the sky's the limit. Um, and that's just the fundamental premise. So just I want to show you one more case study before we wrap up. This is CCJJ, Criminal Courts and Juvenile Justice. Um, we started working with them in June. We developed their TOS. I'm not going to go through the details, but essentially victims of violent crime, um, they get grants to get treatment and help they need because um, of, of problems that happen because of the violent crime. Um, let's just go to their FAST. So we worked. We did a TOS. This is, is this their FAST diagram? We did a FAST diagram, functional assessment of speed and time. Um, and I know Ken's going to give you guys some great insights on this stuff as well. But we can look at their touch time and their lead time. Essentially, their touch time is, or their lead time is about 35 days, but it only takes about 110 minutes to actually do the job. So seeing what's happening in your system, where the gaps are, where you're batching, why are you waiting, you know, parallel sequencing, all these great things. And again, Ken will hit all of this tomorrow. We'll hit a little of this too. You get insight into what's happening time-wise. So between the throughput operating strategy and some simple things they did with full kit, just, just with their throughput operating strategy, they brought their average days to determination from 33 to 13 in two months. With this, now that we just completed their FAST diagram, we're probably going to get it to seven or eight. So the reliability standards have gone from 50% to 81%, which is great. And that's just the beginning. 
So with very short things in just a couple of months, we've seen significant improvements in this, the Department of Commerce, Department of Labor. This month, we're starting to see some great stuff with um, National Guard. So every environment, when they can do some simple things, is really critical. I'll leave you with um, this. We connect it to the budget. I won't talk about that process of ongoing improvement, Poogie. This journey is never over. We're never done. We can always, 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 always get better. So this isn't like a one-time project. This is how we do our jobs. This is how we operate, is continually looking at getting better. And we have an obligation as public stewards to do a best, the best job possible for the taxpayer and equally or if not more important for the people we serve who are dependent upon us to get what they need to be successful in their lives, especially as we're talking about vulnerable populations. There's no time to wait or to make excuses. We have to deliver the best products possible for the people we serve. It's so exciting, this work, and um, I learned so much from you guys, and it's just a real honor to associate with so many of you, and I hope that we can continue to learn from you guys as we move forward. So tomorrow we'll be doing a six day, six day, oh my gosh, slit my throat, <laughs> six hours, even that's too long, we hope we won't bore you, um, on measures and a lot more details about how you set all this up. So. GOMB. We have a whole website with all of the curriculum we have and training modules and videos. Um, GOMB at utah.gov. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe some some uh, some questions for this speaker. I gave so much information, so much energy, and uh, oh. How you manage to move the people to believe that it is possible to to improve and to change and and, and because you know it's still or is it because of the uh, maybe it's because of religion or or <laughs> you know I'm I'm always looking for the answer yeah, how to convince yeah you guys can all become Mormons and it'll be easy no <laughs> is is this on no can you turn it on yes. okay. Yes. Um, it was, it's a great question, and I don't think anyone has the magic answer on that. Um, one, it starts with us as leaders. If we don't believe it, no one else will. It takes um, courage just to try it out and learn and, you know, try that. But also, if you can get a few people, just a few people to make big improvements. We worked with a group, Unified Labs. It's the lab's lab system in our um, Department of Health. And they have some subsystems. They do toxicology and all this kind of stuff. And a couple of the subsections were really grumpy and didn't want to do it. But we have one who just gets it. And when one person gets it, then everybody else starts to see it's possible. So sometimes you get just a few people who can be change agents. The rest will come on board. And as I understood, uh, you have a very big support from the governor. How you managed to convince him? He was, ex well, I, he was skeptical at first. I came and said, um, we need to do at least 25% improvement. He's like, Kristen, seriously, what are you talking about? He was skeptical at first, and he actually talked to me about a month ago because he goes out and we, we tour the agencies, and he's like, I'm a believer now. But he had to see himself, some results, and he saw what we did at Workforce Services, and he had to take a leap of faith. And... Um, I hope that we can deliver this for him because my job's on the line. So, <laughs> yeah, I think his job is on, the, job line on the line as well too, so. because he made a, such a promise, and you know, because uh, that's a problem I think with some managers. They they promise very small improvement, and then when they deliver, they say, "Okay, we achieved." And if you achieve 23 percent of improvement, you didn't deliver on your. Although it's maybe the biggest improvement ever, but. Yeah. So, so it, it, it is really great achievement to convincing the top guys and, and other people to, to move. And we wish you very best, and we hope you will manage to inspire some of the here All that right. they will achieve. Okay, All thank right. you very much. Thank you so much.